Welcome everyone. We're so pleased to bring you this next session with Tim May, Creative Director at Explain. Tim is a uniquely gifted specialist in visual thinking and visual communication, and his techniques will give higher ed faculty and leaders a head start in making instruction and presentations even more lively and engaging. Tim, welcome. Thank you so much, Linda. I am very excited to be here today. Um, I'll talk about myself in a moment, but I'm just really excited about this topic of being able to deliver some visual thinking ideas for higher education. Uh, this sort of hits at a sweet spot for things that I'm passionate about. So, so uh, I, I definitely have been working this manner for a number of years. Uh, so I'm really honored to be a part of the uh, Wacom Education Summit. Just making sure everyone can see what I'm presenting. It looks like I'm relatively clear, so uh, I'm going to keep moving and uh, very excited to uh, to be a part of this. So let me start with, with telling a little bit of a story. And, and in this story, I'm going to talk about the value of sketchnoting. So I uh, live in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I work in Portland and I am a bike commuter. So most of the time when I am uh, going places, I ride on two wheels. Um, you know, Portland has a very good cycling infrastructure. It's not very difficult to get where you need to go on bikes in Portland. Um, lots of really good bike trails. But unfortunately, um, I was driving someone. Uh, this is the fall of 2012. I'm going to take you back, sort of paint the picture. Probably raining, if I remember the day. And we were coming up I-5, which is sort of coming up this direction from the south. Um, and I was dropping off a guy somewhere in the city who needed to be dropped off for his car. And I took the water out, exit off of I-5. I was driving along, coming up Yam Hill, and I realized I needed, I was in the wrong place. I needed to get all the way over here. I was in the wrong part of, of, of Portland. So, okay, took the wrong exit. I'm going to make a, a hard right on Martin Luther King on MLK. Um, then I got to need to take a left turn right away, go back around, and I was eventually trying to get back over here. But at this point, the story gets a little more interesting. All of a sudden, an officer stops me and tells me that I had just committed three infractions all in a row. So I didn't realize that I'd, I'd done that, but um, apparently I'm not terribly good at driving in Portland. So to go back and understand what infractions I just committed, well, apparently, as I was coming down this direction, um, at the first stop, I had a rolling stop right there. So I, I, I failed to make the actual stop sign. I didn't go to come to a complete stop at that particular point. Then, as I turned on to MLK, there's multiple lanes on, on that road. So I immediately crossed like three lanes of traffic in order to make a right turn on what was actually a no right turn street. So all those three infractions added up to a fairly substantial ticket. So you can see here, pretty big ticket. In fact, when I say it's a big ticket, it was a stupid, long ass, giant, enormous ticket that uh, takes up my entire screen. Um, and so, so in thinking about this experience, right, the, the, the first thing, thing I think is crap. Um, this really adds up. This is a lot of money. Like, like, you know, when things like that happen, the moment I see the ticket, I'm, your, your mind sort of goes to, what are the things I'm going to have to do without in order to be able to pay for this? Um, and so, so I'm sort of thinking about all those things. And the, the officer told me, now, you can either pay the ticket right away or you can do a couple of things. And here, here's the things that we, we recommend you could possibly do uh, as a way to, to make up for this. So there's a share the road safety class that you could take. Um, and there are a couple of other things that you could do. And if, if you do those things, maybe the judge will give you a little more leniency in, in the cost of the ticket. Um, so, so as I mentioned, this is 2012. Um, I had started doing some sketch noting, that kind of thing, but, but, but I just, I, I went to this um, share the road traffic safety classes as a sort of like, well, if anything can, can help me like reduce the cost of this, this ridiculously large ticket, that would be good. So I show up at this course and these are the notes that I took um, in, in this course. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and just show you, they're not the best, um, but you can kind of see, right, that I'm, this is, is early on. I was, I was an early sketch noter. This was just a part of my, my trying to understand what was going on. 
and and so you know that the, the finding out that everyone needs to share the road right um that 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 cars bikes pedestrians motorcycles anything on the road is considered a vehicle um and that the law is always changing that's really helpful for us who are trying to just obey the law but we don't exactly know what it is because it's different this week than it was last week so i took all these little you know nice little sketches trying to understand like what they were telling us about like um, you know, you can see a little thing here, right? That it's like signal 100 feet before the lane change turn, right? I was I was taking some good little notes. These aren't great, but they're pretty good. Like, like you can you can get a little bit of the story. So I, I I wrote down all of this and thought, okay, well now I have a little better understanding of of some of these ways to share the road. I did tell the officer in sort of a little pathetic rant. We all get so pathetic when we're pulled over by a cop, right? All of a sudden we're like, please don't tell me. And in my groveling, I said, I'm really more of a cyclist. I don't know these roads terribly well as a motorist. So so, so I think part of the reason he was like, well, try and take this course. But I took these notes and uh, went to the Multnomah County Short House, <laughs> Multnomah County Courthouse, and showed the judge these notes. And uh, the judge um, said, I didn't have to pay anything, that the value of sketch noting in this case is $811.28. So... <laughs> That was that was at least my experience. So so my hope is as you go through what I'm going to be sharing with you today, that not only will you save yourself money next time you get a speeding ticket and that you can like use your sketch noting skills to impress a judge to show them how much you learned, um, but also really the value of sketch noting in my view, as I sort of unzip the next part of my presentation and move over, the value of sketch noting is the value of engagement. Um, what you know, how valuable is it to have people engage in what you're sharing? And I think that, you know, as educators right now is such a critical time to to be able to have students engage. Um, and, and so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, but almost everything I go through for the rest of my um, uh, seminar, the, the rest of my session today will be focused on this idea of using these sketch notes to make learning engaging, to get people checked in. And uh, and I'll talk more about that as I go on. So as, as mentioned earlier, um, I am Tim May. Uh, I have loved Wacom and used their products since 1999. Uh, that was the first time I got a Wacom tablet and started you know, sketching on, on tablets. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about my setup today, how I'm sketching in real time and, and what I'm using. Um, but, uh, but to tell you a little bit about my backstory, uh, I'm the creative director at Explain. It's called, it looks like Explain. I didn't come up with that but we explain things that are hard to explain. We're a design consultancy. And what we like to say is, uh, since 1993, we've been leading the world at leading change through people. And it's a very uh, human-centered change organization, and we use a lot of visuals, visual thinking, sketch noting as part of our process. I'll talk more about that later in my presentation. But I wanna talk a little bit for, for a moment now about how people learn um, and, and learning in memory. So your brain is hardwired to receive and read visual input. Um, and, and if you think about the way, you know, the, 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 when we're looking at something that is a series of words, um, we don't necessarily have a terribly long memory for those words, right? That I could say, scary, drooling, teeth, snarling. These words are translated sequentially in our brains, which basically means every letter is translated in our brain as a single picture and it's putting those pictures together and trying to understand the meaning of all those pictures as they combine. However, when our brain sees an image, it has a very different reaction, right? So seeing the image of the scary, snarling, drooling creature, the pictures are translated simultaneously in our brains that we're having uh, this almost immediate response. Um, and, and not only are we recognizing it more quickly, we're remembering it longer. So the value of images and the value of, of kind of sketch noting in this regard is it makes content and information sticky. So one of my first recommendations is just use more pictures and use better pictures in, in the way that you're, you're trying to communicate with people. Um, we, we understand that we need to use words. I'll talk more about that in a moment, but this is, this is called the picture superiority effect. Let me say that one more time, the picture superiority effect. Uh, and um, you can look it up. There's there's lots of research on sort of the way your brain encodes information and the way images sort of are double encoded. So moving forward, I want to talk for a little bit about literacy. Um, so literacy is the ability to both read 
and right. And I think that, that when, when we're talking about literacy, um, it's important to, to know that because of the way our brains are wired, we can already read visual images very well, right? The read part, we've got it down, right? It's like, oh, I see images, I, I make sense of it. It doesn't require any training, um, just the, 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 the information that's already in our brains will, will allow us to understand images very quickly. Um, however, not everybody is literate in being able to draw, right? To create visual content for others. So part of my first uh, sort of challenge for, for those attending is don't be visually illiterate. Um, let's build up some, some visual literacy in a way that allows us to communicate with our audience. Who is our audience? <sighs> students are the best, aren't they? I loved being a student. I've loved students ever since I graduated. Um, I just think like university students are wonderful human beings, fascinating. And so one of the things that, that becoming more visually literate will allow you to do is better communicate with your audience. And in building up literacy, um, I wanna talk a little bit about where you start. So a couple of points as I get to that. The act of drawing creates engagement, right? The fact that I'm drawing right now on the screen is causing you to kind of like, oh, that's pretty cool, right? This is, this is kind of a, a uh, this is a pretty magnetic presentation Tim's got going on here. Sorry, I'm a dad, dad jokes just sort of come out. Um, but, but that idea of drawing, creating engagement for people and getting people involved, right? It's particularly effective when you're doing remote teaching and learning, right? That, that as people are watching things on a screen, it is so darn easy to tune out. I know we've all done it. You might be doing it right now. It's like, oh, my Twitter feed. I, there's something I wanna, wanna check in on. But, but the fact that I'm drawing just allows this to be a little more fun, right? That it, my, my hope is that it brings a little more uh, engagement to, to what we're talking about. So back to that note that I was talking about, like learning to, to be visually literate. Um, so when we're talking about drawing and, and writing, so I've been doing this for quite a while. And so for me, drawing really is the same as writing, right? That I think that like drawing equals writing. Um, and let me just get my, my correct color here. There we go. So just, sorry, just grabbing the right color. There we go. Drawing equals writing, writing equals drawing. These things are very much the same for me. Um, the, the, and, and so that when I think about like visual language, I have developed a, a level of visual literacy um, that, that allows me to, to kind of draw and write in a manner that, uh, that, that I can, I feel fairly proficient in, right? And I can, I can do this pretty well. And I, I want to think about like, if you think about children and the way they learn to speak, they learn to talk before they know the alphabet, right? We know that these letters combine to make these words. Children don't know that. They just know how to say dog, cat, mom, dad, iPad. And they know that before they learn the alphabet. So why do we learn the alphabet, right? What's the point of, uh, you know, if we already know how to talk, what's the point of learning this written language? And in answering my own question, which is a really great, great way to present, um, learning the alphabet allows you to connect ideas and thoughts and sort of builds this muscle memory between the concept and the thing, right? It's connecting your hand and your brain and your eye in a way that allow you to associate that concept of cat with the letters C-A-T. So, so that's what the alphabet allows you to do. Um, so, you know, visual literacy, like, you know how to see already. I've talked about like that, that, you know, our brains are already hardwired. And imagine like, like going to a country that was foreign to you, but already knowing how to understand, uh, how, how, to, how to like understand the language, right? That you could already read it, but you couldn't write, right? And that's the way all of us are uh, who have not really made an endeavor to improve our visual communication skills. So that, that concept of, you know, you know how to see, but you don't know the alphabet. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about what I mean when, 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 I'm, when I'm talking about the alphabet, but I want to take this great quote from one of the, the world's greatest um, children's book authors. Um, this is Mo Willems, and he says, cartoons are merely a bunch of shapes put together in the right order, just like your name is a bunch of letters put together in the right order. And letters are just a bunch of shapes you know how to draw. That's a long-winded way of saying that if you can write your name, you can draw any cartoon in the world. Um, and I just love that, right? What, what, what a lovely thought. 
Um, and so, so as I get into sort of knowing the alphabet, uh, I'd like to sort of give you guys every, a, a way uh, to jumpstart uh, your, your visual thinking. And instead of, of thinking, right, you know, it's like I was classically trained, right? I went to art school. I know how to measure with my thumb and I could, it's like, that, that it's gonna take too long. We don't have time for art school. So let's just start with 12 simple glyphs that you can use and put together in different ways in the same way you would with the alphabet to allow you to be able to be literate. So the visual alphabet was something that was developed by Explain's founder, Dave Gray. Um, let me change my color here. All right, so, and these are, I'm gonna zoom in on this section here. Um, these are 12 glyphs, point, line, arc, angle, spiral, loop, and circle, oval, kind of like eye shape, triangle, rectangle, polygon, and cloud. I forgot to write cloud there. There we go, all set. So these shapes, you can just take them and combine them in the same way that you would combine the shapes to make your name and then it creates the meaning of your name. You can combine these shapes in ways that allow you to create meaning uh, for, for sort of visual language and objects, right? So if I wanna draw a fish, right? I'll take that, that sort of pinched oval shape and I'll, so, so there we have that. I'll take the arc from the other side and put it on the back, turn it sideways, right? We'll put another arc right here, give it a little eyeball and a couple of little, you know, now, now I've drawn a fairly convincing fish and it didn't take much. Maybe I'll put a line in between the, the, the back of its tail fin. Um, emojis are cool because they are uh, nonverbal communication. Um, and you, you sort of think about the, the thing that emojis accomplish, accomplish with our telephone conversations. They sort of help with tone of voice, right? When you're texting and you can't actually use tone of voice. So as, as you're drawing emojis, Right, I've taken the circle shape here, and then I'm going to add, uh, you know, just to, to be able to show a couple of different emotions, right? Let's get our, our, our sort of, you know, our OMG, right? Is just multiple circles and maybe a couple of dots. Not hard at all. The next one is, uh, you know, if you wanna show the, the, the kind of love eyes, right? I'm, I'm just putting a couple of extended arcs on either side and then an arc maybe a little line and a line, but now we've sort of got that, that, that lovey emoji. I'm gonna move this one over to the corner to, to give it a little more space, but right, uh, if, if we're thinking we wanna show like the angry emoji, right? So I'm going to add a circle around the bottom for the mouth, maybe put a couple lines in that circle. Um, I'm going to, you know, add a couple of slits for eyes, but then I'm going to do a couple more lines here and then I'm going to add a couple clouds, right, to kind of show that this person is steep and angry, mad, grumpy, <coughs> super, super upset. It's so moving down with a couple more examples. Um, trees. So it's really easy to make a convincing tree, right? I'll, I'll, I'll just start with maybe the simplest, right? I'll take a circle and, and a couple of lines. And that, that to me is a fairly, you know, that, hey, I've got a tree now. But there are lots of different types of trees, right? So maybe I'll take my cloud shape, but use the same technique. So now I've got a tree, but it's sort of like a, you know, using that cloud as a background. Or maybe, uh, you know, the Northwest has a lot of these wonderful evergreen trees. Um, being able to just quickly put these shapes together jump starts the ability to draw. Um, and, you know, one that we're all very familiar with right now, uh, let's make a, a, an oblong circle, a couple of lines, a couple of arcs on either side, um, but just putting these shapes together uh, allows us to to really quickly communicate ideas in ways that are nonverbal, right? That, that 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 sort of bypass some of the the, the language challenges that we might have um, if we're if we're using just words. So, so that that was tip number one. Start with the alphabet. Uh, if you just if if you feel like you can't draw, well then start with these particular shapes and and realize that you know it's not as hard as you might think. Um, just putting the shapes together in the same way you put like letters together, which are just shapes to say your name. Hopefully that's making sense. So moving over the next tip, simplify. So uh, one of my, my favorite challenges that we've had, and I've taught a lot of these courses in the past is um, how few strokes can you use to make a convincing approximation of an object? Uh, and so we, we had this challenge of, you know, can you make a convincing cat? And somebody came up with the concept of just doing a spiral and putting a couple of little 
dots there for ears. I think you know the, the idea of that sort of visual haiku is so appealing of being able to to, to say something very you know in just a couple of of, of lines. Um, the other thing is we we encourage people not to make it harder than it needs to be in order to tell the story. Um, sketch noting is is often associated with with graphic recording when we're trying to visualize people's ideas very quickly as they're talking about them. We don't necessarily have time to like oh, tell me well give me a second to figure out what that looks like. Um, so, so with the concept of desk and chair, right, I can show that there's a chair here uh, thinking about like, well, there's a part people sit on and then that back part probably leans back just a little. There's a support and then under that support, maybe a couple of wheels. That's probably enough to show that this is somebody's office chair. The desk is a little bit over the chair. So I'm going to put the top of the desk here and then show that a, there are a couple of legs coming down off the desk. All right, pretty good so far, um, but they have a computer. Oh, okay, well, there's the keyboard. All right, we got that taken care of. There's the monitor. There's a little sort of holder on the monitor. And they've got a coffee on the desk. These are all just using some of the shapes that I showed you on the left, lines, arcs, dots. Um, it's, you know, the, 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 in, in this visual alphabet, these first three elements of the visual alphabet, the point, the line, and the arc, you can really draw anything with those three elements. Um, and I've got an art degree, but it's like there isn't anything else you can do. Everything else is just composed of either lines moving around, lines waving in different directions, but, but that sort of gives you a little sense. As you gain a little more confidence and you've done this a little bit more, I, I recommend thinking about kind of building your own library of icons that you need to draw frequently. So, so things that, that, that are common in your world, and that's going to vary massively depending on you know, what discipline you, you are uh, focused on, um, start to think about like ways that you can quickly approximate these ideas that you come across again and again and again, um, and being able to, to visualize those, those ideas. So the next point I wanna get to is people. So humans are drawn to humans. And so uh, one of the things that Explain is known for is doing lots of information graphics that show lots of little people doing lots of things all over the place. And the reason that has been a successful business model for 25 years is that uh, humans, particularly when we deal with culture change and trying to get people to understand behaviors, if they see pictures of humans doing the things that we would like them to be doing, that's a pretty good way of, of influencing their behavior, showing them here's what good looks like. So there are lots of different ways that people in this field draw humans. Um, Dan Rome is a legend, uh, author of, of several of the napkin books. Um, he likes to sort of draw these, these stick figures with a big head. Uh, you'll see consultants do these kind of starfish, uh, you know, head, star, body, um, these kind of round belly, bubble belly people. Um, the angular people are, you know, a little trickier, but I, I've seen a lot of people who kind of like that sort of uh, hard edge angular look. Um, most people who work at Explain end up drawing people, what we call card people. Um, and and the, the, the card refers to the shape of the body of the characters that we're drawing. Um, and so when, when I talk about card people, uh, what I'm saying, and I'm just checking the time, making sure that we're, we're good. I think we're right in the right place. We're, 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 we're right where we wanna be. Um, the body is this card shape and, and a couple of things that are kind of magical about making the body this shape. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment. Circle for a head, a cup, you know, lines with bends for arms, lines with bends for legs. Um, but in the body, you sort of think about starting to put bodies together. You know that there's a leg that's going to come off of that side. There's a leg that's going to come off of this side. There's an arm that's going to come off over here. And there's an arm that's going to come off over here. So the advantage of having that box is that you know the four corners of the box are connected to the limbs of the character that you're drawing. The next thing to think about is what is the activity that's taking place, right? So, so tip three, people are drawn to people. And as you start to think about how to draw people in, in using this, this methodology, um, you think about what shape the body's making as the person is, is acting, right? Um, that if a person's running, right, that body is, is kind of lean forward, the head is down, right? The arms are going up and back. One leg is forward, the other leg is back. Uh, you could even, you know, steal something from cartoonists and show some of those like motion lines and you know, the, the coolest thing cartoonists ever came up with was the sweatles, right? The person's sweating as they're running. Um, and, and kind of a similar stance when they're punching, but look how different the rest of the body is, right? I've taken that leg that's closer to us 
and moved it in front, whereas the leg that's behind is bent backwards in order to sort of deliver that, that power to the punch as it moves forward, right? We can't really even see the, the head in this one because it's behind that glove, um, you know, in the yoga pose, right? Once again, a good example of just how those four corners associate with being able to show where, where the body is going and, and, and you just pull the limbs from those corners and, and it's fairly simple from that point forward, right? Here, once again, the four corners, the arms are coming from, from these different corners as he's pulling on the rope. Uh, the leg is sort of bent forward. They've got the other leg that's sort of bent a little further back and trying to support and, and pull backwards. Um, but, but this kind of gives you a little sense of, right, it's pretty easy when you think of it as just putting these little shapes together. Um, I'll talk about faces in a second. Um, but yeah, I talked about, oh, the other thing, right? A little beak right, that you put on the edge of it, the nose indicates the direction that, that the head is pointed, right? That if I were to put the nose on the other side, right, it tells a slightly different story. But you can, you can get a lot of, um, you know, in, in trying to think very simply, uh, just that simple line for a nose is a really good indicator. Um, a lot of times when I'm trying to show multiple people at sort of a, a, a smaller scale, I don't have the time to, to, to invest in, in showing a lot of facial emotion. I'm just, I'm trying to, in fact, convey emotion by the stance of the person that I'm drawing. So, so that you kind of think about like what kind of stance uh, is going to convey sort of, uh, you know, as, 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 as a, I, I think about like a, somebody who's, you know, maybe a little bit impatient, right? They're going to be, you know, the legs are going to be stiff and the arms are going to be at the sides, right? And this person's kind of looking forward and, uh, and maybe the foot's tapping, right? There's, there's a very different emotion from, you know, from somebody who's just, you know, sad and hunched over, right? That now if, you know, if they're, if they're completely hunched over and sad, right? The head's drooping, the arms are down, like this person is miserable. Um, so, so that kind of gives you a little sense of, of just a, a couple of the ways that we would start to like use this as a recipe to start to draw humans. Um, the other thing that, that we think about that, that is, is easy and simple is, is we do use a lot of Egyptian perspective where we're kind of showing the body in a front profile, in, in, a, in a frontal view, but the head in a profile from the side. Um, and and we're, we're putting them together in a manner that kind of allows you to see like that head is at one angle, the body's at another angle. Um, but, but it t gives you enough information in a fairly simple way. Um, as I mentioned before, that, that concept of, of showing the objective perspective and, and drawing the desk in with the person sitting there now, right? So same concept as before, right? They're typing on a, on a, on a keyboard. Uh, we've got a computer behind them. Uh, this person is a uh, Coke Zero drinker. Um, so they've got their beverage there. Uh, but, but just being able to kind of quickly complete the picture with as few lines as possible. So I, I, as, as you start to get into things that are, that are you know, poses that, that convey the emotion of the thing that's happening, right? If a person's presenting, right, their body is fairly straight. Um, this, this is a nice little hack that I'd recommend, right? That, that, that off arm just going down into the side somehow just reads really well. That's something that, that we do all the time. Uh, but kind of showing that this person is, is pointing to information. Um, and then I, I, you know, as you get a little more advanced and you're starting to show faces at different angles, Right, the full, you know, the front face, uh, sort of, you're you're seeing both eyes. At a three-quarter view, you're seeing, you know, one eye toward the edge and one about in the middle, and then with the rest of the features sort of off and, and away to the other side. And then with the profile view, you're showing uh, a side view of of the of the image. Um, and and it's important also to, you know, so, sort of, as you get better at this learning quick ways to show different hairstyles and show show that you know that we you want to represent the full diversity uh of of humans that's out there so so you want to be uh you, you don't you know when when i started in this industry it seemed like everything was a a, a white male and i feel like we've made a lot of uh, progress in being able to show lots of different people and be more inclusive um and understanding of of people of you know of all different sizes shapes etc so um, the next thing that you might want to be doing as you've started drawing these simple humans is add some emotion into the face. So giving a little bit of detail for, for how you could add emotions. And so the next thing I'm sharing is the great unemotional grid of emotions. Um, so this is an exercise that will help you be able to quickly show just about any human emotion um, in a manner that, that, that is kind of a, a cheat. It's kind of a hack, uh, but that's what we're all about, right? We want to make this as quick as possible, quick as an on-ramp as possible to be able to, to be uh, active and being able to show this. So as you mentioned, uh, as, as I mentioned here, I've shown nine faces and each of them has just uh, a couple of, you know, lines and a little, you know, angle 
for the nose for each of these nine faces. And instead of trying to draw emotions, what I'm gonna try and do now is fill out a matrix. So these three points along the top are the eyebrow line. These three points along the bottom are the mouth line. And if I just fill out this matrix, I'm not trying to do any, any kind of emotion here, but I'm going to go boom, boom, boom. And then here we've got this one. And then this one, we've got this one. It's just shapes. And then on the, on the bottom row, we've got flat, 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 frown, 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 smile, smile, smile. And what I just did was, was created nine different emotions without really thinking about whatever, you know, I, I wasn't trying to accomplish any of that, but you can see this sort of wonderful diversity, right? Look at this guy. Uh, like that's conveying a lot in just a couple of little lines. Whereas, you know, if, if you look at, you know, this person is so sad, um, you've got the, you know, the meh face up in the corner. Um, but, but this is, you know, like, like a quick trick of being able to think about like, okay, I want to convey emotion in these faces. Here's a way that I can start to, to do this. So moving along, the next thing I wanna share, um, I'm calling this drawing hacks. And the reason I call this drawing hacks, you can look here, right? I've done these little cheats that, that just help the drawing look and feel a little bit better. So you can see on, you know, the shiny blade of the ax, I've added, you know, th this is this is a, you know, something that, that Illustrator's been doing for ages, right? Drawing that little sort of sparkle to show that it's shiny. I've also added this wood texture um, on, on, the, on the, the, the ax there to, to make it look like it's, it's made of wood. So I'm gonna pull in some of these things that, that we sketch noters, artists, illustrators like to do just to quickly be able to, to make sense of ideas and, and, um, and, and that save us time. So, so one of my favorites is the brick fence hack. Um, you see all this space in between these two little samplings of bricks, um, and there the, 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 there's nothing there. But your eye kind of glues it together just by showing these couple little lines. Really show that there's sort of a, a concept of a brick fence there. I'm going to zoom out just a little. Um, you think about like grass, right? Showing a big field of grass, um, just adding a couple of those little lines in there. Water is very similar. Right, so, so showing these little water lines convey the concept of, of water here. Um, as we move down, right, um, there are a few things that always imply that something's made of paper, even though that's not exactly what you're looking at, right? Most paper doesn't have the corner neatly folded over uh, in, in that shape, but uh, adding that little corner fold just automatically makes your eye think of this as paper. Another hack that I use all the time is the squiggly line hack, right? Where where you, you, you put these little squiggles on the sheet of paper and your brain puts that together as text. Um, directional lines also kind of help show what what direction the 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 um, each angle of this three-dimensional object is going to be. Um, right? The leaf hack adding these little details on the inside to just sort of make it feel leaf like something we do all the time. Um, so this is the cookie cracker hacker. Um, so trying to show that something is a Ritz as opposed to a chocolate chip, as opposed to a sugar, right? These slight variances in texture um, convey that those are all basically just, you know, ovals with slightly different treatment on all of those. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I showed the magnet hack kind of showing these, these lines that, that imply attraction um, or the it's the same thing, just turn it on its side and it's the apple pie hack. It makes it look like it's hot and delicious. Um, the, the, the sort of advanced case study here is the sandbox. So here I'm using a couple of more like maybe second level hacks in, in being able to show what, what these textures look like where um, I, I'm imagining that there's directional light coming from this direction. So with that, there's no texture on these top surfaces, right? The, the, these four surfaces on the top of the, of the sandbox don't get anything, right? But then on the opposite side, there's gonna be a shadow right here. Um, and then on these sides where it's sort of half, right? It's sort of, you know, it's not in shadow, it's not, it's not under light, I can see the wood texture. But on the right side, there's a shadow, it casts a shadow going this direction, and I put a little shovel in the middle. So this is for the more advanced students who are, who are looking to sort of push their skills forward a little bit. But that gives you a sense of, of different ways that, that, that these textures can kind of make practical enhancements to your drawings um, and help them make sense. So sketch noters do a lot more than that. Um, we like to dig into lots of cool textures. So these are a little more like decorative enhancements that you'll see people doing sketch notes doing just to make their stuff look cool. 
um, everyone wants to look cool, right? So so here you'll you'll see like these, I call them jacks, right? You remember the jacks and you played with the ball? There was like a game with that. And I have no idea how you actually played that game, but I just remember seeing what these things looked like. Um, adding them is just one of those like, frilly, you know, sometimes you're not adding content for the sake of it necessarily having a function. It's just formal to make it look cool. So adding a series of spirals, you'll see a lot of sketch noters doing these progressive arcs, um, putting scales, uh, wavy lines, zigzag patterns, um, the sort of tiles or parquet floor look, um, concentric circles, always draw your eye in. Um, and then a lot of these sort of corner flourishes, right? A lot of times when you're doing sketch notes, you're, you're just, you, you realize that you've got some content and you want it to stand out. So putting a couple of these cool corners uh, around the edges of your content is a way to uh, amp it up a little bit, give it a little more so, sort of like style and and, uh, and and get people interested in in, in making it uh, look cool. So these sort of like art deco style corners, um, other little frilly things to, to just kind of, you know, draw people in. We're trying to engage. So. The next thing I want to talk about is when you're writing for sketch noting. So obviously, sketch noting involves a lot of actual like lettering and writing, um, and so so when you're doing that, it's just important to kind of keep in mind. Um, I I actually have bad handwriting, and and that that this this would um, like maybe maybe not sort of disprove that that contention, but. I, I'm not great actually, and, and I, I come from not having really great handwriting, uh, but I've sort of grown to, to think about this, this underlying grid behind the letters that I, that I write. So if I'm writing the word, you know, lettering, L-E-T-T-E-R-I-N-G, I kind of know where each of those, you know, what, what point each of the letters is going to hit in that box um, just, just to keep in mind, right? Uh, M and W uh, are slightly wider. Um, important if you're going to write the word Wacom. Uh, so, so you want to try and think about having relatively consistent height, um, fairly good legibility, um, particularly as you're sharing this with people. Um, the the other tip that, that's important that's a part of lettering. So, tip five was write clearly. Tip six, label everything. So. As you begin your visual thinking, sketch noting journey, um, you're not going to be good to start out with. Most people aren't. Um, but if you put a label on your drawing, people will put those things together very quickly, right? So, so one of the things that that rookies often do when they're trying to learn to work this way is they they make all of these images and they haven't quite figured out how to do them super effectively, and so people are kind of looking at it. But if, you know, just by adding a couple of, uh, of, of letters below, now we're able to really understand what it is you're, you're, you're sharing with this image. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, a little later on about how these images kind of bring people together um, and, and, and sketch notes can kind of get people on the same page. So the next thing I want to talk about is going to be ways to designate items as titles. So in some cases you you won't you know you you have a certain word that you've drawn but you really want that word to to stand out um, and so as we as we think about like ways to show titling um, these are a bunch of of things that you can do to just sort of make that copy stand out and and sometimes you you think of it as you're going you realize I'm at the top of this page so I'm going to put a banner on this thing but sometimes you sort of realize that after you've already done a bunch of words and you need to say, okay, well, I'm just going to put a little cloud around this word right here to make sure that it really stands out. So, so, so being able to add these elements, right? The banner, um, the shadow box, um, you'll see a lot of examples here where adding a shadow on one side of the copy just gives it a little more like, huh, that's kind of cool, a little more visual appeal. Um, and and sort of creates the, the other thing that does is sort of give, gives it a little more life, right? That there's there's just a little more uh, energy to that. So clouds, wavy lines, this doubling is something that um, Mike Rohde, who's one of the world's greatest sketch noters, he literally wrote the book on it. Um, that's one of the things that he does uh, is is sort of doubling up those letters so that as you draw, right, and as you write, you're you're able to sort of make these really nice. Right, and and one of the things that, that that does also is it's kind of forgiving, right? That is, as I as I do this double line, um, I'm able to to see, right? That it's like, oh, I need to put a little bit more on that side. It, you know, it still looks pretty good, even though it's a little rough. Um, putting boxes around letters is kind of fun. Um, offsetting letters is kind of a nice, appealing way to 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 make them stand out. Um, adding serifs, right? Um, making sort of big bold italic or outlines. These are ways that that you can 
make something look or feel like a title. I've also got the script here. Um, I don't think they teach cursive anymore. Um, but luckily for, for uh, cursive people, there's this hand lettering re revolution that's going on where people all over the world are really amazing at, at making beautiful script writing. Um, I'm certainly not one of the great ones, but, uh, but I, I follow all of them on, uh, on Instagram and it's definitely a sort of a fun world to jump into. So tip seven, in making marks, I wanna talk a little about the tools that I use to make effective marks. So as I, as I get into this, one of the things I, I, I recommend is try to find a tool that allows you to vary the stroke weight. Um, and stroke weight is kind of a fancy term for just the thickness of the marks that you make. So one of the great things about those big Sharpies is that you can use the thick end to make a really, really thick mark, but then you can use the thin end to make like a relatively fine mark and that kind of gives you that ability to have this like thick, thick edge around the outside, but then the thinner lines on the inside and that sort of give it a, a little bit of, of illustration credibility, right? It starts to feel a little more like your, um, you know, a, a, a polished drawing uh, as opposed to just a crazy idea. So sketch noters, uh, graphic recorders, uh, you know, real-time illustrators, we do a lot of that, that sort of varying the stroke weight to kind of show, right, thick line on the outside really sort of draws your eye to the object, whereas the kind of thin line on the inside uh, gives a little bit of sort of art and, and style. So um, varying the, stro the, the, the stroke weight is another nice way. I'm not sure why this uh, particular astronaut is connected to a hot dog, but um, it's adorable, right? Like, it's cute. The next thing I wanted to talk about is connectors. So tip number eight, um, as you draw little vignettes, um, you almost start to think of them as nodes, right? As, as you connect these, these ideas and thoughts. And there are, um, you use a lot of these different ways to connect concepts and, and show that how, how they might be related. So if I'm talking about transportation and I want to, to talk about transportation's relationship with infrastructure, um, then I've got these two drawings here. And now I sort of have this connection um, of being able to show how this feeds into that. Um, and I'm, I'm showing a lot of, of crazy arrow styles and examples here um, in, in ways to show connectors, but um, all of them work. Um, you just kind of have to find what works best for the content that you're trying to prepare, right? The, the, that um, one of the things that we see often is like trying to show the concept of something sort of extending beyond its normal box. So what does it look like to sort of push the, the envelope of that box? Uh, a lot of times we, we have that concept of wanting to show a call out uh, from the thing that we're talking about. So this kind of three dimensional call out of the wing of the, um, uh, you know, those things that wind goes through windmill. Um, yeah, showing the windmill or, or just showing how, you know, coffee uh, times seven equals, you know, you're pretty wired up. So um, and, and yeah, just sort of using these outlines and other ways of, of being able to separate objects and ideas um, so, so that you're, you're able to help your viewer differentiate between the things that they're looking at. So moving on to the right, um, a couple of, of thoughts here in, in the world of sketchnoting. So I, I think that sketchnoting lives in this world of visual thinking, design thinking, design sprints, uh, visual facilitation, graphic recording. These are all um, disciplines that, that you see a ton in, in business right now. Um, so, so lots of organizations are, are kind of investing in some of these skills um, to be able to create better products, right? That you see this a lot in product design um, and people making things. You, you see this a lot in service design. So people coming up with new, you know, services that they can offer. Um, you see this quite a bit in, you know, experience design, right? So in designing experiences for people, um, and, and so, so you see a lot of these, these things happening in, in a lot of these different areas as they, they start to, um, that the, the, this type of work can supercharge these types of interactions. So, so that, that as, you're, as you're doing your design thinking, right, prototyping, your, your sketch notes are a marvelous way to quickly come up with your prototype for your, for your product ideas. Um, you know, really great ways of being able to, to kind of get people to tell their story, right? That, that sketch noting is a, is, a, is a really nice, you know, shorthand for storyboarding, right? You're, you're, you're sketching out what the story might look like. So I wanna show you what it looks like at Explain, um, just to give you a little example of how we use this type of thinking, this type of working. So at Explain, we have this discovery session that is highly co-creative, 
that we're working together with uh, a number of, of stakeholders and subject matter experts to really sort of dig into and understand, you know, what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? What is the nature of this thing? We ask a lot of questions and we draw the answers. So, so that as we're asking questions, we're drawing what we think the answer to those questions might look like, and we're inviting everyone to participate. Um, I always know that I'm doing well on a project when one of my stakeholders grabs the marker and starts drawing with me. Um, that, that leads me to know I'm, I'm headed in the right direction. Um, and then once we come up with our, our sort of primary ideas that we think are good, we synthesize those ideas and we do more drawing, right? Now we come up with usually three or four key drawings that we think are a good way of, of telling the story we want to tell. Is it the A or the B or the C drawing? We kind of figure out like these are our concept sketches. And then um, as we move forward, we kind of figure out like, okay, well, we want A with a little bit of C and a little bit of B in it. Um, we, we go down and we polish that drawing and we get into production and then we try and figure out like, how do we roll this out to people who are our stakeholders? How do we make it um, real for them? What is it, you know, is it going to be a poster? Is it going to be uh, an animation? Is it going to be a uh, web experience? Is it going to be sort of environment design, whatever? Then we start to sort of build our things based on this blueprint of, of what we've drawn. So now I wanna show you like with this, a couple of other ways that, that I use sketch noting um, that, that are um, a little different, but I still think fun. So I wanna show you some examples of real time sketch noting or graphic recording, where in this case, I was doing a project um, where over the run of this day, uh, I think there were nine speakers. And then in between the speakers, um, I was drawing the, the cool musical interludes and other things that were happening and, and adverts and, and, and whatnot for this conference that I was a part of. Um, and so, so here, um, these, this is sort of a, a live version of this, this kind of sketch noting that, that um, was uh, projected on a screen so that people could see what was happening in real time. It sort of uh, enhanced the, the show. And as speakers would, would kind of speak, right, I would detail what they were talking about and take these visual notes um, that summarized what their presentation was about. Now, here is another really good tip, pre-draw stuff. Um, in this case, um, you know, Ruth E. Carter was an amazing presenter, uh, but I didn't want to find myself having to create a likeness in real time. That would have been really, really um, intimidating. And so I pre-drew the picture of her head um, so that I, I kind of had that already. And, and I think I might have actually done some of her name as well, just so that when I started, I, I wasn't behind, right? I didn't want to spend half of the, the note taking time in just drawing her face. So, so this is, you know, when, when you're doing this kind of work, it can be helpful to pre-draw. Um, same here with Jeff Gomez. Um, you can see that, you know, the, the, the likeness is pretty good. Um, I had a lot more time drawing this image on the left uh, than I had to do all the rest of the notes where I'm capturing a little more rapid fire. It's still effective, uh, but it's a little bit different kind of communication. And you can see me using some of these tips and tricks that I've talked about throughout our, our time so far as, as ways of, of kind of uh, showing how to do it. So some kind of concluding thoughts. Um, student engagement is, is what I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation is, is so important for us right now. And having some empathy for students is really critical. <laughs> um, we think about what they've been through, particularly this year. Um, empathy mapping is something that, that Explain uh, has been doing for a long time and is one of the, the originators of, of this technique of, of just trying to understand, right? If I were a student right now, what am I thinking, right? What are some of the things in my mind? Um, you know, probably one of the one of the things that, that I'm thinking now is, you know, maybe a little bit of Zoom fatigue. Um, and, and also, uh, I just want to be normal, right? That, that like my college experience, um, is the, the new normal is not normal for, for the social side, right? I miss hanging out with humans. Um, so, so that there's, you know, that's a real concern. Um, you know, I'm seeing, you know, like, like mask mandates and do I wear it or don't I wear it? And the sort of, you know, like, like how can I be safe without, you know, endangering myself or others? Um, kind of what they hear, who's talking to them, right? What kind of influences are they hearing, right? Are there, are there influences coming from social? Like, you know, I'm old enough that I don't know how to draw TikTok, but I can draw like um, Instagram and uh, Twitter pretty well. Um, oh wait, I didn't draw Instagram well. There we go. Um, so, so you know, what, what's influencing, you know, what, what they hear, what they say, 
and, and what they do, part of the reason for this exercise is just trying to get into their shoes and, and try to understand them. Of course, it's best if you if you can talk to students and, and, and learn from them and kind of fill this out in a way that helps you see that. But what this usually leads to is trying to understand like what are the key like pains and gains in their world, right? What are the things that are the most challenging in the storm clouds, right? And what are the things that they're really looking forward to and aspirations? And that way we can create content that's going to influence them, right? So, so if some of their pains are sort of loss of social, like boring Zoom meetings, um, right? That they're they're kind of, we, we, we start to get a little better picture of, you know, who they are and how they think. And, and what they want most is, you know, to, to sort of um, feel like a student, right? So how can you make a student who's who's doing their courses remotely feel like a student. Um, just just a couple of thoughts here as as we start to sort of empathize with our with our audiences and how we engage with them. Um, but but I I think that you know hopefully what this demonstrate this this presentation has demonstrated for you is that sketch noting creates engagement for creators and observers. So as you create content and and build sketch notes into your um, you know educative uh, work. Think about the way you actually gain from working this way and others gain from working this way. Encourage students to draw as they're taking notes on your lecture um, and, and use visual tools to encourage them to, to adopt ideas. Um, being more visual is not that hard and I'll talk more about that in a moment. A um, couple of other sort of like key takeaways. It improves retention for creators and observers, right? As you draw, you're going to to remember these drawings more and the people who see your drawings are going to remember them more. So so there's sort of a a, a dual nice synergy is a bad word. Um, but but in any case, this sort of helps, you know, helps retain helps you retain knowledge, create put it in a lock box. <laughs> um, it builds clarity. So so helping people collaborate. Uh, visuals are non-threatening. I'm sure you've been in a room of instructors who are fighting over words, uh, right? Um, that that happens all the time. However, not too many people fight over bad drawings, right? Bring your bad drawing. And, and, and when I say bad drawing, really what I mean is just bring your, your little concept sketch, right? Bring your first drawing and it's a lot less threatening um, of, 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 a, of a sort of collaborative tool and, and people will, will, will respond to it. The last one, and I hope you've seen this as part of this presentation as well, it makes learning fun, right? Sketchnoting just makes it a little more enjoyable uh, to to sort of participate in in the learning process, right? That if if people are drawing and, and you've got like these kind of fun marks going all over the place, like that's highly enjoyable. So so um, that's that's kind of the the formal end. And and now I want to get into what I imagine are a lot of questions. Um, and I'm I'm gonna sort of sc scooch over here uh, to probably the first question a lot of people, which is Tim, how did you do this? Um, and I want to show you. Here is a, uh, a little image of what it looks like from the other angle and, and what, what you're not seeing from my setup. There's an eagle saying, how did you do this? Um, so I have a cheap green screen behind me um, and my screen is being composited with a, an app called Mm-hmm. So Mm-hmm uh, is, they, I guess they wanted to, you know, come up with, a, with an app that you could say with your mouth closed. Um, it, it's putting together the picture of me uh, along with my desktop. Now, the next thing that's really critical to this presentation is um, I am sharing a Wacom 21 inch Cintiq tablet. Um, so this is a tablet that I'm drawing on in real time and I can see the image that I'm drawing on. Um, but, but I also, you, I, I wanted to say that in the corner, there's, there's a little one by Wacom, uh, which is also a, a, a really nice cheap product that um, allows you to do essentially the same thing. Um, not much of a learning curve, plugs in USB to everything. So, um, I, and I'm not just shilling for, for uh, Wacom here. My son has stolen the one that, that I had because he really likes using it for math. So, so that the, you know, you, you, there, there's multiple uses for, for these tools. Um, the presentation itself is being presented in Adobe Illustrator. So that's where you're seeing me draw all these lines. Um, and, and that's the, the presentation tool that I'm using to be able to, to put ideas together um, and, and draw everything that you see here. So as I plan this out, um, I use the Mural app. It's a web app, just works in the browser, essentially works as this kind of shared virtual workspace um, that, that allows me to um, just work with, with stickies and push them around and put this one over here and then you know, strike that one and then let's you know, come up with the ideas. But you can kind of see like the run of my thinking sort of going from 3.30 to 4.30 left to right 
and, and what I was planning for for each of those little sort of 10 minute increments as I as I go around. Um, the next thing that, that I would advise is as you're teaching, use these shared virtual workspaces and use breakout rooms, right? Getting people to work together in small teams um, is and, and require something of them, of course. They're students, they'll tune out if you don't if they don't have an assignment. Um, but having uh, you know, an assignment in a in a shared mural space gives people a chance to really engage and, and almost forces them to engage, right? If they know that they have to 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 log on to this thing and and execute something as part of it, then you know that sort of just um, gets them more engaged. Uh, a couple of thoughts about working visually. So the on-ramp to working this way is quick and affordable and you can start really, really small. Um, so so I just wanna um, share a couple of like, you know, you can start with paper and markers, um, you can purchase the tablet, um, you can, uh, you know, enable pens when you're working. If, if you're just um, working in PowerPoint, you can enable pens um, and, uh, and then, um, you know, in your next meeting, just start drawing. So I think we're at about one hour. So hopefully we're, um, if, if there are any other questions, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take them, but this has been uh, a blast. Uh, and uh, I, I'm certainly grateful for this time. Uh, if you wanna follow any of my work, um, you can follow me through LinkedIn. I'm, I'm just Tim May. Um, and these are some of the socials for my company Explain. We are Explain Design Consultancy. I am Fresh Beast. Uh, we are Explain the Company. I'm once again Fresh Beast on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you so much, everybody.